Well, I think we're close enough. Uh, if you would please uh, join me in uh, standing for our flag salute. Remain standing for a moment of silence, please. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. It's always nice to begin a, a meeting uh, with honoring one of our longtime employees. Uh, it's actually kind of a bittersweet time because we, uh, we want to honor them, but at the same time, it's always sad to see them go. And um, it's, not a, it's pretty uncommon to have someone who has devoted 42 years of their life uh, any occupation uh, and it's a special day to have someone in Tulare County that we can honor today and this is for uh, a longtime employee in our Health Human Services Department she retires as our, a Deputy Health Human Services Director for Mental Health and uh, before I go any further I'd like to invite uh, uh, our director to please come forward uh, uh, doctor please come forward and uh, Say a few words on, the, on behalf of your employee. I will. Good morning, Chairman Worthley, morning. members of the board, uh, Mr. Rousseau and Ms. Bales Lang. Um, today is indeed a celebratory time as Cheryl Perkins retires from Tulare County after nearly 42 years of service. It's actually 41 years and eight months to be exact. Um, this time trajectory is not only a noteworthy career ac accomplishment by anybody's standards, but especially remarkable during a time when the average employee changes his or her employee every three to five years. Cheryl actually began her career in Tulare County in 1969. She was hired by the Department of Social Services, or otherwise known then as the Welfare Department, just after graduating from high school. She was employed as a junior clerk typist, I have a little bit of difficulty envisioning that right now, but um, <laughs> she was employed as a junior clerk typist and subsequently held all related support classifications through the position of supervisor until 1974. She was then promoted through the eligibility series, including supervisor. She worked in welfare subsequently as a training officer and finally a program manager. In 1998, uh, Cheryl was transferred to the Department of Mental Health, reclassed as a program manager for children's services. Uh, she there provided direct oversight to a number of units, including several multidisciplinary teams. In 1999, Cheryl moved again, uh, this time to the position of division manager over alcohol and drugs, and then uh, several months later, joined John Davis at the time and assumed the position of division manager over adult services. And finally, in 2005, as Super Worth, Supervisor Worthley noted, she was promoted to the Division of Deputy Director, where she uh, continues to work for a couple of more weeks. Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, in addition to detailing a laudable career, which I wanted to do, it should be noted that this is really a lesson for those just embarking on perhaps young careers. Uh, good things may come to those who wait, but more often in the work environment, good things come to those who are thoughtful, intentional, and competent people. Above all, good things come to people willing to make, take chances and people willing to move beyond their personal and professional sphere of comfort in the service of client care. On a final note, uh, the number and range of diverse people who have benefited by Cheryl's tutelage, tutelage excuse me, is likely obvious always generous with her knowledge, uh, quick to offer any colleague assistance, fair-minded in her approach, especially in uh, disciplinary matters, <clears throat> frequently fielding calls late at night and on weekends without complaint. They're all descriptions which highlight her team approach to problem solving and service delivery. But above all, most noteworthy has been Cheryl's unwavering commitment to the clients we all have the privilege to serve in Tulare County, and this commitment is absolutely unsurpassed. So on that note, uh, Cheryl, you can make your way forward and um, either take a couple of pot shots or make some parting comments. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I just want to take this opportunity to say to you thank you. I wouldn't have imagined that in 1969 when I be began employment for Tulare County that it would culminate in such a rewarding career. And I've had the opportunity to work in every district in the county as well, serving your constituents in a variety of ways. So I feel very honored today. <clears throat> and um, I couldn't have been as successful as I feel that I have been uh, without the support of my staff. And it is the staff of the agency and the county uh, with whom I work that really do the job and they do it well. And I thank them for their support. Thank you. Don't leave, Cheryl. <laughs> Don't want to mess up the makeup. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Dirksen, for your kind words. I, I was thrown off for a minute because Cheryl Dirksen, Cheryl Perkins, it threw me off. Like, wait a minute, have I got the name right? That I was afraid to say the wrong name. John, John refers to us as Cheryl Squared. Cheryl Squared, yes. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's it is an honor. In the late uh, Jim Maples, uh, supervisor of District Five, used to say that the highest honor that the county can provide you is with the seal of the county and uh, that's what I have for you this morning and I always thought that was sort of a solemn occasion until John Davis told me they referred to it as the giant coaster <laughs> <laughs> something that it's lost something I don't I don't understand it but it is still the highest honor we can provide because we're precluded by law from giving any kind of cash bonus or anything so in appreciation of your 42 years of service and dedication, and I think really the uh, important word there is dedication to the community and Tulare County, uh, it's my honor to present this with you from the Board of Supervisors, and thank you, Cheryl, for your service to us. Oh, and Cheryl, I was just curious, when you started off as a, as a clerk typist, was it a manual typewriter? Uh, actually, it was an IBM Selectric. Oh, they had Selectric. I remember the Selectrics. That was a great machine. <laughs> Trust me. And this will hang in a place of honor in my home right next to my husband. So we have, we have an action poster. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would love to give my, my colleagues an opportunity to say something to Cheryl at this time, and I'll start with Mr. Ennis on my right. Cheryl, thank you so much. Uh, you know, you live over in my district, uh, actually from my hometown area out there, Terrebelle area, so real proud of you guys and both of you and proud of you and what you've done for the county for 42 years. That is a commitment. That's a long time. Uh, I spent 34 years in the car business, and I know that was a long time. So. Uh, congratulations to you. I know you'll be missed by not only the people within your organization, but throughout the county and the county family. So thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you. Dennis? Cheryl, since you grew up in the Terrabella area, you guys must be related. <laughs> <laughs> but in, the, in the last several years, Cheryl, it's always been a pleasure to work with you. You always have a positive attitude. Uh, I'll basically always have a smile on your face and I think you've been a very important part of our mental health program. Now before we get down to Supervisor Vanderpool, I was thinking about you know 42 years and I was going to wear my my shoes that I bought in college uh, that are 40 years old and that's more than twice as long as Pete's been alive. <laughs> or almost twice as much. But we're going to really miss you because I know how important you were to the program and the dedication you've had over the years. So thank you very much for your service. Fox? Wow, that makes me reflect. In 1969, my shoes for sure were that <laughs> big. I literally wrote in my book, Cheryl, and I'd like you to look at it later, misprint over the number of years that you've worked here because I thought there's no way She's such a young, vibrant, hardworking person. How could that be? And I wrote that in there, didn't I? 
So, but thank you. I mean, I had the pleasure of being on the mental health board for a couple of years and, and seeing your, uh, some of the fruits of your hard work and you will, uh, and your backbone and your, will, will be hard uh, to replace. But thank you for your many years of service. You're wonderful. Mr. Vanderpool. Cheryl, thank you very much for your many, many years of service. You know, I, I sit here and I just think 42 years, man, that, that is amazing. Uh, and my, one of my fellow supervisors <laughs> made the comment already, so I don't need to say that you served longer than I've even been alive. But, um, but you did. I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that because that, uh, uh, you know, employees that can actually say that, is, I mean, and that's not saying that I'm super young, um, but that's just saying that you really are dedicated to Tulare County and you're dedicated to the people you serve. Um, you know, it's not, it, it's more than just a, a day in, day out job. You love what you do and you love the people that you help. And uh, to, to work for the county for that number of years and to help as many people as you've helped, especially in the programs that you've worked in where people really do need the help uh, and, and they look to you for uh, aid in time of need, um, I, I just really, really applaud you for all that you've done. And I know that it takes a great team, but it also takes a great team leader and you were definitely that person. So. Thank you for your many years of service. You're going to be missed, and I'm going to miss looking across the room at the mental health board meetings and seeing you over there. Uh, but you're welcome to come anytime just to hang out or just say hi. So uh, thank you for your years of service, and I, I wish you the best of luck in your retirement. Thank you, Cheryl. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I don't usually do. May I make a comment? Absolutely. When I, I um, will have my 30th anniversary in February, yes, I know it's longer than Supervisor Vanderpool has been alive, and I've dealt with countless county employees. When you first start in the county council's office, you're sort of thrown in this giant bureaucracy, and you really have no idea of what we do and how we do it. And uh, there are some people that just stick in your mind. Cheryl is one of the people who, when I needed a guide to uh, try to understand the intricacies of the welfare system, as we called it then, was a tremendous help and education to me, and I've never forgotten that, and I wanted to thank her very much. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, we're gonna, our next presentation, item number two, is a, a declaration, proclamation declaring September two, <clears throat> 2010 as Library Card Sign-Up Month in Tulare and uh, Tulare County, and we want to encourage our residents to sign up their children to get public library cards, and maybe the parents could do as well. And Mr. Lewis is here this morning. Brian, thank you for being here. Thank you, Supervisor, Supervisor, CAO, Council. Uh, we in the library think that the library card is the most important card in your wallet or your purse, especially for a young child, because the possibilities with learning how to read learning how to ask for what you need, learning how to utilize information properly is the most important skill you have in life. And the libraries do so much more than uh, just provide books and information. Uh, just about any service that's available in the counties or the cities, whether it's mental health, medical help, um, uh, looking for jobs, advancing your career, we do at the library for people. So it's just a great resource for everyone. It's the great equalizer. And we're having the sign up this month. And uh, we're encouraging people to sign up. And like you said, Supervisor Worthley, both adults and children, but especially the children. And we'll look forward to the proclamation. Now, part of what we're doing is we're starting a, uh, a read program. And we're developing read posters and read uh, bookmarks that will be displayed at all of the libraries and giving out. And the idea is to get uh, people in the community who are leaders, people who are uh, admired, to be on the read posters to encourage people to read, to have some effect on, gee, if, if they think it's important to read, maybe I think it should be important to read. And uh, the first people we're having is, is the board. We took your pictures the other day. Uh, your poster is going to be uh, unveiled one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and we will be, uh, well, you know, I don't have much of a chance to brown nose, so this is a good opportunity. Uh, and, you know, Davis does it all the time, so I, I don't get much of a chance. Can we bleep that from the video, I mean, the audio? I, well, I was going to say that, that this is going to be more brown nose than you first since believe, but... Gary Kunkel retired, but I thought that might be tacky, <laughs> so I didn't say it. Uh, but anyway, uh, after uh, a certain period of time, your posters and bookmarks will come down. 
and we'll be uh, trying to get pictures of community leaders, uh, possibly uh, teachers uh, that are important to the kids and the students uh, for their areas. So we'll be taking the pictures and hopefully putting them in schools, putting them in all the libraries just to get the message out there and have it, have it ever changing. Now, the first one, not yet, not yet, is, is of, of Mr. Ennis. And what we did is we took your pictures and there's a certain amount of backgrounds that you can choose. And we chose backgrounds that we thought emphasized part of the best parts of all of you. Uh, Mr. Ennis is a respected businessman, a nuts and bolts type of guy who wants to get something done but wants to build something solid, not just something showy. So if you'd please reveal Mr. Ennis's read poster. Audience? Like the background. The good background. I, I just like seeing Mike like that. He looks real sharp. <laughs> oh, look good back. Thank you. How did my face get so long? <laughs> we, we made brush. you look a little older, uh, Supervisor. <laughs> so, uh, a little I bit feel more it every morning when I get up. <laughs> Supervisor Ishida uh, is a farmer. He knows the value of the land. Uh, so we picked something with the background that was a little earthy. Uh, Supervisor Ishida uh, preaches and uh, the, uh, the wisdom of saving for a rainy day, knowing that not every year is going to be a good year, and he emphasizes that in, in his speeches. So uh, Supervisor Ishida's poster is with a big brick background to, to emphasize the earth and uh, because bricks come from the earth. I thought you were going to have my banker standing next to me. He <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to get close to it. Yeah. Couldn't find it. <laughs> nice picture. Thank you. Supervisor Worthley is uh, uh, a little more cerebral than some. He's the uh, longest, <laughs> longest serving. I didn't say who, I just said some. Uh, the longest serving member on the board. Uh, and he looks forward. He's kind of, I guess you could call him the Carl Sagan of the board. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, out in space. Yeah. Knows the book, No Less Than Victory. No Less Than Victory. <laughs> Supervisor Cox, yeah, if, if n nothing else, is, is, be, uh, be careful. Is no, no, no. <laughs> is, 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 is known for his caring of community and of this nation, uh, of, of his church and of people. He's a very patriotic, solid rooter for this country and for the county. He makes no bones about it. And Supervisor Cox. Can I get those in eight by tens? <laughs> get those what? Can I get those in eight by tens? Eight by tens? Yes, you can. <laughs> and then we come to Supervisor Vanderpool, who is constantly being teased for his youth. But the youth is also a positive. Supervisor Vanderpool has a youthful enthusiasm. He relates to young people, which is positive for the county. And he just has an energy that those of us who are grown up uh, don't have. <laughs> well, I was going to say. <laughs> hey, Peter, you're going to get there. I was going to say. So with, with that in mind, uh, and I, I want to say before you reveal it, is I asked Supervisor Vanderpool if we could use this poster and kid him a little bit. He graciously said yes. Uh, but I wasn't kidding about his appealing to the youth and the young people and communities. I've seen it happening. It's a wonderful asset. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> With the Crayolas. And I must tell you, Supervisor, every female I've shown that to has said, oh, he's cute. <laughs> so, uh, well, you know, Supervisor Cox said he expected a, a box of diapers behind me. But I guess that's a good thing that that wasn't the case. So, it's also taken, so you can let them know that. So, so those are the posters. Uh, they will, we will be making more of them. We'll be making bookmarks with the same things. Uh, these are for you uh, to keep 
Oh. If you would like and uh, put them in here, uh, we'll be making, making more of them. And uh, with that, if you have any questions about the program. I, I do have one question for you, uh, Brian. Um, I, I would just be curious, during this month that it's, you're, you're reaching out to get as many signups as you can for library cards, are you working with the, the school districts and trying to get uh, maybe have a presentation or, or reach out to each school? Because I know that some of the unincorporated areas are uh, a, a long ways from here, so to speak, where the main library branch is and, and may not have that level of outreach. So I was just curious what you're going to be doing to be reaching out. Well, the, the way we're going to reach out to the schools is to go to the schools and to, to get the principal or the teachers with the read programming. At that time, we'll have a library mm -hmm. card drive. Okay. Right now, so early in the year, because we're going to require from the schools, and encourage them to have the kids coming with the applications, but they're going to have to verify the signature of the parent for us, and that takes quite a bit of time. So we want to do that as a whole package. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Brian, I, I, I'm going to come down a second and give the proclamation, but one of the things that I have uh, really tried to push is that, uh, you know, to participate in school activities, students have to maintain a certain GPA. And so I have really encouraged them to take advantage of the library from the standpoint of accessing um, tutoring, um, live tutoring opportunities online um, that are available to those who have a Tulare County library card. Right. And uh, I think that's another avenue, especially as you look at coaches and wanting their, their children to be able to be eligible to continue to participate in sports and so forth. They should be some of our greatest uh, advocates for for getting a library card, so I just wanted to share that with you. Well, thank you. And I, I, I like this first line on the proclamation. It says, whereas the smartest card is the library card. I like that. So anyway, I'm going to bring this proclamation down to you. And Brian, I'll also mention, thank you very much for those posters. They look really good, and I hope that they achieve the ends that you're setting out to achieve. Oh, thank you. We do, too. Okay. Anybody want to say anything else, or are we all good to oh, go? I, I, great program. Great, I, great program. I had a question about that. I'll volunteer. You need volunteers to help go sign up kids for cards. I'll be there. Action item. This is an action item. Very motion much. to approve. I'll second. second. We have a motion by Supervisor Cox, seconded by Supervisor Vanderpool. Please cast your votes. And the votes are unanimous. Thank you for being here this morning, gentlemen. Thank you, Board. And thank you thank for you. your presentations. At uh, this time, we're happy to have with us uh, Tina Terrell from the Sequoia National Forest uh, regarding the Sequoia National Monument Draft Environmental Impact Statement. Uh, Tina is the Forest Supervisor, a uh, very powerful position in, in the Forest Service uh, uh, governments, and we're very privileged to have you here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Chairman. Um, just want to basically give you an opportunity to let you know that we will be having two public meetings for the draft environment impact statement and draft management plan I presented two weeks ago to the board. The first public meeting will happen tomorrow at the Porterville Elks Lodge from 6 to 9. Um, that would basically be a public meeting for the public to come and get information more about the draft documents. Um, I will be there along with about 20 of my interdisciplinary team members to answer questions and provide more site-specific information about what is actually in the draft documents. We then will have another public meeting on Saturday in Bakersfield to get the people from Kern County from 1 to 4 o'clock um, at the Doubletree um, Hotel right off of uh, 158. And that, again, is for another public meeting to get the people in Kern County. And then we'll have a third meeting in Fresno next Next Tuesday. So I just wanted to give the board members an opportunity, let your constituents know that there will be a public meeting for the people in Tulare County and Porterville next week. And then there will be a subsequent meeting dealing with the science process uh, on October 12th, which I'll come back and brief the board again. So I just want to say thank you for your support and for your continued interest in what happens on the Giant Sequoia National Monument. Thank you, Tina. At this time, we have a presentation regarding an update on our loop bus service. And uh, to make the presentation, we have Dan Fox, the Tulare County Transit Coordinator. Morning, Dan. Good morning. Good 
Good morning, Chairman, Board, uh, CAO, Council. Um, I'm here today to give an update on the loop bus, uh, give you a little history. Um, the loop bus was, was uh, accepted by your board in April of 2007 when you uh, approved the loop bus operations. The loop bus was an outgrowth of the Tulare County gang intervention, and that was a true collaboration between the City of Visalia Police Department, Visalia Unified School District, Tulare County Sheriff, the District Attorney, Probation, Parks and Recreation, Transit, your Board of Supervisors, Youth Services Agencies throughout the Tulare County, and faith-based groups. Um, at that time, <clears throat> a need was identified for transportation for at-risk youth. So out of that became the Loop Bus Program, which started in 2007, in the summer of 2007, where the city of Visalia and the county started Loop Bus operations, where we were bringing at-risk youth to recreational opportunities over that summer. And the county's participation was to bring people from Ivanhoe and Goshen into those opportunities to connect with the Visalia Loop Bus and to bring them into lunch programs and, and, and uh, those, those are opportunities. The, uh, the initial Loop Bus program has been and since has been paid for using Measure R local sales tax money. Uh, over the years, the ridership has grown. In 2007-8, our first year, we'd had about 1,500 riders. In 2008-9, we brought it up to 2,300 riders. In 2009-10, we're up to 4,700 riders. And this year, we're hoping to, to reach about 7,000 riders. Uh, the typical services that we provide include that fixed route service where we go to a, a place and pick people up and bring them to a recreational opportunity. Another one that we've been providing is Kawea High School where their after school program we pick up students at the school and bring them to the Exeter Boys and Girls Club. The other type that's developed since is, is one time trips or sports leagues where we bring people to, to uh, flag football or soccer leagues. Um, we do nonprofit trips to McDermott Fieldhouse. Uh, transportation to, to sober graduation and college night events are, are typical kind of trips that we do now. Um, and today we are, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, promoting the loop bus operation through a media blitz. Yesterday we did a press conference. We've had some TV coverage the last few days. The print media has been doing uh, presentations of us. And tomorrow we invite everybody to Porterville where we'll be doing a, uh, a presentation at the Porterville Library at 10 o'clock to try to create more activity and, and opportunities in the Porterville area. Um, the, uh, some of the people that uh, use the bus uh, we, we asked some of the people to come visit us today, and one of those is Angela Ruiz Alvarez, and she's going to speak for a few minutes about how that service affects her and how it works for her. Good morning, Supervisors. Um, I'm glad to be here to represent Cutler Rosa Youth Programs, and we've used the loop bus many times. Um, and um, Supervisor Cox, I remember you were giving out ice creams the first time you were trying to get kids on that bus, so I'm waiting for my ice cream. Uh, we've used the bus many different ways. We've used it for field trips to McDermott Field House. We've used it for different field trips, but what we mainly use it for is our middle school. Um, if you know middle school students, they're very hard to attract to participate in anything educational. They're a whole beast of kids that you have to do song and dance to get them to participate. So what we've done is we've um, incorporated sports into our activities. So if they want to join sports, they have to do the academics first, and then they can do the sports. And we participate in our, our Visalia League here. Now, as you know, transportation is costly. 
um, especially school transportation. Um, with budgets so tight, it's very hard for me to pay for transportation, a bus to come to Visalia weekly. So the Loop bus, we've used it now for two years, and it has saved my program so many dollars that I can put to use in educational activities. Um, so I want to say thank you for that. Um, the, most of the kids that are in my program are kids who need to be there because of education purposes or maybe they're not the best students or they have issues. So when you talk about high-risk students or at-risk students, that's definitely the people that I work with. Um, you would not, you could not imagine that a bus could be so vital to a program, but it is to our program. Um, it's changed the lives of our students because they are so into the sports, we won two trophies. I don't want to rub it into the Visalia schools, but we won two trophies, and that has just boosted their self-esteem, which also boosts their educational um, scores. So I wanted to thank you personally and to let you know that I hope you continue to, to support the Loop. Um, I saw the beautiful buses outside, so I'm really excited, because the one problem with the Loop bus is that you have to get your, your information in first so that you could be able to use the, the Loop bus, because it was very limited. Um, but Every time we use the Loop bus, we've never had any problems. It's, like I said, saved my program so much money, so I thank you for that. Thank you, Angela. Appreciate that. Okay, and uh, before uh, we have two of our new Loop buses outside, the uh, interesting thing is this time we've added a DVD player system with uh, two 17-inch monitors in each bus, and we're planning to uh, have video presentations while we bring the youth to their activities. And we invite everybody to step outside when you do take a break to view the new buses. But uh, I need to uh, acknowledge some people that have worked hard on this program. And one is uh, one of you, a visionary behind the Loop Bus, Supervisor Cox, who has been the driving force behind the Loop Bus since day one. Uh, also, our working partner, MV Transportation, they're the ones that have to come every day and make it all happen. And there have been challenges. So I want to acknowledge Janet Todd, the manager, and Gabriel Tabarez, who is the Loop Bus Coordinator for MV. And then the board representatives, Jeff and Jed, have done many hours coordinating activities and, and, and processing, marketing the program. So uh, we wanted to acknowledge them, too. Also, uh, anybody who needs more information on the Loop Bus should go to the Step Up TC website. It's just been upgraded. It's uh, a wealth of information about not only the Loop Bus, but other activities that are available for at-risk youth. And uh, <clears throat> I'm available for questions. Are there any questions? It, if I can, no, no <laughs> questions, but I want to echo what Dan said. The staff has been just absolutely tremendous. We, you know, Dan probably at the top of the list because the things he's asked to do, he, he's asked to juggle, you know, buses, times, places from one end of the county, sometimes the other, and he's done a wonderful job. And he made a comment yesterday that really stuck with me is, well, we haven't turned down anybody yet, hmm. uh, which I think is, is speaks, you know, volumes about uh, Dan's ability to work with MV and, and get the buses there when the, uh, when the youth need them. Uh, a, a sidebar here, uh, he mentioned the uh, Quia High School students being taken to the Boys and Girls Club in Exeter. They just received their API scores uh, recently and the principal there told me that the youth using that bus going to the WOOF program API scores increased by 97 and a half percent. Whoa. Wow. wow. Amazing. So very successful program for the, and I think for the very minimal amount of money that we invest as a, as a board, um, money, well, probably some of the best money this board will spend. Thank you, Supervisor Cox. I, I would just make one comment too, and, and thank you, Dan, to, and your staff as well, because uh, I think that the, the great part about this program is that you are so innovative uh, in mm -hmm. your office. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you've helped uh, in, in my district on several occasions, and um, there's also a new program that's coming, and you're, you're working with us there, and that's a, an ROTC program for the uh, residents of Tulare and the surrounding areas that attend Tulare High Schools. 
um, right. and that's really going to be a great asset to the community and a great asset for those at-risk youth to be able to, uh, instead of being unproductive after school or causing trouble in many cases, be able to go to a, a program where they can actually uh, create a future for themselves. So I, I really appreciate you doing that and, and thank you to all your staff as well. Quite welcome. Mr. Chairman, uh, yesterday we unveiled the new loop bus in Exeter. Supervisor Cox and Jed uh, were in attendance with the police chief, city council. Uh, it's, it was a community effort. And we had the unveiling of the new bus at the, uh, at the headquarters of the Boys and Girls Club in Exeter. At that time, I received a note, and it reads as follows. Dear Tulare County Board of Supervisors, on behalf of Cahuilla High School students and staff, I'd like to express our gratitude to the board for allowing us the opportunity to provide the working on our future WOOF program at Exeter Boys and Girls Teen Center. This program would not be possible without the Loop Bus services. Our students have shown improvement in academic growth, 9.7 points in our API, a decrease in discipline, and an increase in attendance. We believe in our students. We believe in our students and would like to thank you again for your support and belief in our students and sharing our vision. So we are making a difference with this bus. And uh, sometimes when we do youth programs, it's very hard to measure our, if you're successful. And I think the step up program that's been coordinated by Supervisor Cox has proven uh, its success. And I think the Board of Supervisors have shown that uh, we are committed to the step up program. Mr. Reynolds? Chair? Yes. Uh, and I'm very pleased that we're going to have that workshop in Porterville tomorrow. And I'll be attending. And I, I know that uh, Supervisor Cox and uh, uh, Jed, and there'll be a bunch of people there. But we need to get that out in my area as well as Porterville and surrounding area and make use of that that uh, loop bus. I think it'll improve the whole community. So thank you. And it's a wonderful day in Tulare County. And then we have two loop buses outside whenever you get an opportunity to we, see we, them. We're going to take a little five minute break now so we can go do that. We will want to try to keep the five minutes. We need to get back. We've got a time item. But one thing I wanted to ask you, you're not going to show Ferris Bueller's day off. <laughs> okay. With well, that, we'll take a five minute break. We'll go out and take a look at the bus. Okay. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get any taller, Pete, but <laughs> There they are, hiding in the back. Back hmm. yeah. there eating cookies. Uh-huh. I meant to call you yesterday and ask you, but um, I don't know what your, uh, what your Friday looks like. I had a family thing come up on Friday. We're missing our CAO and county council. I think I just have one thing. Yeah. <laughs> Are they eating cookies? I think they're still. Uh, I think they're still out front. Huh? back in session and uh, this time we have public comments um, I have two written requests for public comments and of course we're not you're not precluded from making public comments beyond this beyond this but uh, Richard Garcia uh, has requested to make a comment I understand Richard has a brief uh, 
video he's going to show us, and I said, as long as it's within three minutes, you're good to go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Richard Garcia, 1038 East LaSalle Avenue, Visalia. I'm a member of the uh, Mineral King Group Sierra Club. Richard, can you pull that mic just towards you where, yes. so that people can hear you on the video? I'm here audio. this morning to ask for your cooperation to help us protect some animals that live up in Balch Park. As you probably know, Balch Park is part of the uh, Sequoia National Forest System, and in, in fact, it is included in the monument. The, um, let's back up here. What we want to do is protect these particular animals that are very rare and endangered. And they, uh, Walsh Park is part of their habitat. They include the Pacific Fisher, the California Wolverine, the American Martin, and the Sierra Nevada Red Fox. The uh, Pacific Fisher is on the list of uh, candidates to be included in the endangered species list. There's a very small population, we believe, in our southern Sierras, and there's a population up in the northern Sierras. The California wolverine is a state-threatened animal. The American martin, very rare. In fact, it was one thought that it was extinct up here in your area of the park. But um, not too long ago, they found one uh, roadkill, and so they feel that there is a small population up there. These animals all inhabit the kind of the elevation, the kind of uh, forests that uh, are in the Balch Park area. And then we've got the Sierra Nevada red fox. You may have read in local paper that they spotted one of these just north of Yosemite. And we're hoping that uh, these, these animals can make a comeback. There have been people that said they think they have saw this animal up in uh, the southern Sierras, but it's always a, uh, uh, a debate on whether they saw a red fox or a gray fox. Okay, the national park, what I want to do is talk to you about the rules as they pertain to having pets in the parks. Now, unlike the national parks, the Forest Service does allow you to bring your dog into the parks, and they have some very reasonable uh, regulations. Basically, you to keep your dog on a leash or restrict its freedom. Basically, you go into the park, keep Fluffy in the RV or the tent with you, and if you go out in the forest, keep him on a leash. All right. The county regulations are very similar. Okay. Um, these are county regulations. They also include one particular aspect that we really like, that pet waste should be cleaned up after the pet owner. It's a, a scientific biological fact that the single greatest vector of transmission of canine diseases to these wild animals is through contact of fecal matter, okay? So I know this regulation was probably adopted by the city dads years ago, and they probably had Mooney's Grove more in mind than Baltz Park, but we feel it is a very reasonable request, and we would like to work with you folks to educate the public that if they bring their dogs into the National Forest, keep them on a leash to pick up after them. Now, there is one group of citizens that don't have to abide by these rules, and that is the guys that buy a hunting license and go bear hunting with hounds. They are allowed to release these packs of hounds. The hounds chase bears. We also feel that they would chase any other animals that they came across. They tree the bears, and then the hunters shoot the bear out of the tree, okay? How Pardon? I said how very sporting. How very sporting. <laughs> yes, um, we're not calling for a halt to, to bear hunting. Um, we're only asking that the hunters abide by your regulations that make sense and help protect um, these animals up here. Now, the resolution that I have in, in front of you would send a message to the California Department of Fish and Game that you feel that the hunters should abide by the county regulations. I'm also, we're also going to be asking the National Forest Service people 
In fact, I'll be talking to, Rita, to Tina tomorrow at the Giant Sequoia Monument um, uh, Management Plan meeting. We would like to have these um, regulations asking that all California citizens abide by those regulations as far as keeping their dogs and their leash in the national parks. Uh, I know you're probably thinking, well, you know, state law trumps county law, but this spring, the department decided they wanted to open up San Luis Obispo County to bear hunting. Um, normally, black bears weren't in that county, but there's some indication we do have a few. I don't know if you ever noticed when you go to the coast and go over Cuesta Grade, you'll see a sign, watch for bears. There apparently is a few bears in there, and the hunters pushed the department to open up San Luis Obispo County to black bear hunting this year. The uh, County Board of Supervisors wrote a letter to the California Department of Fish and Game uh, protesting that. Their, their science was very spotty. They uh, enlisted some Cal Poly students to do a study which amounted to hanging uh, cans of tuna into trees and looking at teeth marks of cans and looking at bear scats. I don't think they even saw a bear, but they justified trying to open up San Luis Obispo County to black bear hunting this year. The County Board of Supervisors wrote a letter to them and uh, did or passed a resolution, and they changed their mind. I have a copy of that resolution if you folks wanted to see it. So we think they would listen to you if you send a message to the California Department of Fish and Game and just ask them for common sense uh, compliance to the county's rules. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Okay, any questions? Questions? As you know, we are precluded by take, for taking action on items on consent on, on, when it's a public comment period, not on our consent on our, our I'm sorry on our agenda today. But we will review this information. Thank you. Here. Thank you. I have also a request from uh, John Davis, our director of Health and Human Services, uh, to make an introduction this morning. Welcome, John. Thank you, John Davis, Health and Human Services. Uh, I just wanted to take the time or a minute here to uh, formally introduce our. Uh, new director of human services, uh, Jason Britt. He's been with our uh, organization for over 15 years. So, and it is as Supervisor Ishida uh, once described, we're growing our own. Um, <laughs> this, he came in as a, uh, uh, an eligibility worker. He took on jobs like the imaging and our CalWIN implementation, which is that huge computer system you dealt with for about five years. Um, we moved him to the public guardian's office uh, as part of the program. Uh, he was there for a little over a year. And then we brought him back as the deputy director for uh, human services. With David's retirement, which you all witnessed uh, a while ago, we asked Jason uh, to step up, and he has. And so with that, I guess I'd like to introduce him to you and to your constituents so they formally know who the director of human services is. Come on. Welcome, Jason. Congratulations to you. Thank you, John, um, Chairman, members of the board. Um, I am um, privileged to have this honor and to have this um, position, and I just look forward to continue serving our constituents and working with you to deliver effective human services uh, programs in our county. So thank you. Very good. Congratulations to you again. Anybody else wishing during our public comment period to make a public comment? Seeing hearing none, we will close public comment and we'll take up our board of supervisor. Steve, you got one. You do have oh, one. I'm sorry, excuse so me, sir. Late. I was a little too quick on the draw there. Come forward, please. You can use this microphone. You can use that microphone. Please give us your name and address. My name is Robert Owen, 16151 Mustang Drive, Springville. I think this is the right time for me. Um, I've been on the agenda here for quite some time on this um, oh, land this division. Oh, 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 Mr. Owen, I'm sorry. Yes. This is the matter coming up. This is the public hearing. Okay, we've got this coming up later? It's coming up in a moment, yes. Okay. Just give us a few more minutes. We're going to take care of uh, a you. couple more items. We're a little late, but we'll, we'll get to you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Anybody else wishing to address during the public comment period? All right, now we'll close that and bring it back to the board for Board of Supervisor Matters, beginning with the Mr. Vanderpool. Um, I, I just have a couple things uh, for today. Um, since we didn't meet last week, I wanted to make a comment about the Festival of Hope uh, that was put on uh, at the Tulare Outlet Mall uh, Labor Day weekend. That was a great event. Uh, the Suicide Prevention Task Force uh, put together a great presentation, and I really wanted to thank uh, the staff of the program uh, and also wanted to thank all the volunteers because that's what made it happen. 
Um, there was a great effort, great outreach to uh, inform the public about suicide prevention uh, efforts and techniques. And um, I, I just thought it was a great program. I attended, it was a little hot. Um, and uh, other than that, the sidewalk art was beautiful and uh, there was a great turnout and really reached out to the public. So I thought that was great. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to mention was the 9-11 blood drive that took place in the city of Tulare uh, this Saturday. Uh, another great turnout uh, by uh, the time that I left the event, uh, there was already, uh, I left about 11 o'clock and there was already 346 pints of blood donated, um, or, or 436, I'm sorry, uh, pints of blood donated by 11 o'clock. So it, it was a great showing by the community of Tulare, um, and I really applaud all of their efforts to help give life uh, back to uh, those who may need uh, a little bit of help. So. Uh, I really appreciated that and uh, sure enc encourage everyone out there to uh, give blood and give life when they have the opportunity to do so. You know what's thing about the parade tomorrow in Tulare? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and then also the uh, uh, Tulare County Fair uh, begins tomorrow. Uh, there is a parade uh, beginning at 10 o'clock, um, and uh, then the fair will open shortly thereafter. So I look forward to a great event there, uh, and I encourage everyone to go out. Uh, the fair will take place from Wednesday through Sunday, um, and it goes on all day long. Uh, chalk art was great. Sidewalk art, you got to call it chalk art. Uh, this afternoon, 3.30 COS, uh, the Visalia campus will have a uh, open house in the unveiling of the new gymnasium funded by uh, Measure I, which uh, I sit on the oversight committee. So folks are invited to attend that. Um, on Saturday, attended the Taste of Arts Visalia. Uh, event put on by the Consortium of Arts and was privileged to be one of the judges and we, we brought the art back. We'll be putting that on the internet soon. I wanted to share with the supervisors. There were several categories. One of them was Seize the Moment, which was there were uh, just pieces of paper like this and uh, materials there to draw with and this was done by a 13-year-old uh, La Jolla student from Visalia who won the uh, uh, spur of the moment contest. And then I think the other uh, districts are all, some of the other districts are also represented. We had uh, over a hundred entries of art, several of them from schools. Uh, this is from a uh, Los Tules Middle School student who won, I believe, the uh, most edible <laughs> award. And then we had the, uh, well, there was a disagreement on this one, but this one won the most nutritious, and it is from a, uh, uh, from Stone Corral School. I believe that's out in Supervisor Rashida's. No, my district. That's in your district. So this, this uh, won the most nutritional, because it depicted all of the food, well, most of the foods grown here in the valley, and it was kind of whimsical. And then the uh, best in show and most artistic was from a student uh, from Three Rivers. And all of the artwork had to do with, uh, you know, things that are grown here in the valley and artwork that is edible. So it was a very fun event. Several hundred people attended and I was uh, very glad to represent the board there as a uh, uh, participant, as a judge. And Eric Coyne was our a staff person who worked uh, very hard on that. Uh, the event was put together in a very short time frame and uh, it turned out very well for the time they had to, to plan, but a very good event. Very good. Mr. Sheehan. Last week we hosted uh, approximately 28 outdoor riders that came into uh, Tulare County and thank you for the work uh, from Eric Coyne representing the, our office and Leslie Cavig Caviglia representing Visaya for putting a program together. They went up to the park, uh, they went to Mineral King, some of them went mountain bike riding and they were very pleased with the recreational opportunities that they found in Tulare County. One of the uh, participants mentioned that usually they get about 40 to 60 riders. I mean, well, outdoor riders that come in on these meetings, and we were a little short this year, but I think it's probably halfway explained that if you drive down 99, 
The only city we have in Tulare County on the on 99 is Tulare, the city of Tulare. Most people don't realize how many people live in Tulare County because Tulare County was basically developed on the east side. We have all the east side cities. Um, they were all enthusiastic about coming back. Supervisor Cox and I met with them yesterday morning at the new Ag Farm Worker Museum. They were extremely impressed with the content of the museum. And uh, in fact, several of them said they'd come back just to look at, at the museum. Last night, I had a uh, town hall meeting in Lemon Cove. And the topic that, um, excuse me, uh, Three Rivers. And the topic of that conversation was the ambulance service. After many, many years, Lemon Cove had an independent ambulance service, and the board of directors decided to suspend that service because of some changes in the state laws. And so last month, they closed their doors, and the other service providers in Tulare County filled the gap. So now we have an ambulance stationed in Lemon Cove. Uh, Exeter Ambulance Company has two days a week. AMR Ambulance out of Tulare has two, uh, two to three days a week, and they rotate with uh, American Ambulance out of Isaiah. And one of the board members uh, mentioned that he believes the service is, uh, now is as good, if not better, than what they had before. And uh, the, the ambulance response time, which is 20 minutes to three rivers, 95% of the uh, they're over 95% compliant in meeting that time frames. So three years ago, when, when the ambulance issue came up in Tulare County, that we were looking at having one provider for the whole county, and the Board of Supervisors decided that maybe we could get our independent companies to work together, well, they have, and it's worked out the better service for everyone concerned in Tulare County. In fact, moving the Stationing the ambulance at Lemon Cove also helps response time to Woodlake. So we have less and less jurisdictional fights between the independent ambulance companies, and they're working, in my opinion, very well together. Last Thursday, we, got, we received a call out of the blue. Uh, I think most of you are aware that they're removing the rail from Strathmore down to Joe Vista. And the last time I looked was last Saturday, and they were south of the city of Porterville. Teapot Dome. So, uh, Teapot Dome Road, and they're moving quite quickly on uh, salvaging the track. They're just putting the track over to the side. They're not removing the ties. But Thursday, we received a, an unexpected call from Short Hall Rail Company, which I cannot divulge the name of, that are interested in talking to TCAG about rebuilding that line, that 30 miles. So you, <laughs> the rail issue is just a moving target. You never know uh, from day to day what may develop. So we'll be talking, the TK representatives will be talking to this new rail company, and we've never talked to them before. And it shows the interest in short haul rail nationwide. And this rail company is an East Coast rail company. We'll see what happens. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Mr. Ennis? Thank you. You know, you left out Tipton and Pixley and along Highway 199. You know, those are some pretty good sized metropolises, and it's coming too. So, you like Cherubella. You like Cherubella. <laughs> well, last week, uh, Supervisor Sheeta and I attended a uh, fundraiser for Sierra View District Hospital on Saturday night, and it was a very nice event. It was at Larry Young's Indian Oaks Ranch, and uh, uh, they raised over thirty thousand dollars for Sierra View District Hospital, so I thought that was a was a very nice event. Uh, of course, tomorrow we'll be uh, attending uh, the Loop Bus Workshop in Porterville at ten o'clock, uh, which we hope will be very fruitful for that area. Uh, we'll also be going from there to Terabella to work on the logistics for a step up event for the Terabella uh, Ducor uh, Rich Grove area. So. That's coming up probably next month, and looking forward to that. Had a meeting with Brian Ward, who's one of the city councilmen with Porterville, him and John Lawless, the city manager, and working towards planning a step-up event for Porterville. So 
things are starting to open up in that area and hopefully we're going to get some some events moving forward so also uh, was very excited about our broadband meeting we had yesterday uh, that's going to be big in, in influence in our area uh, Ducor, Terabella, uh, Portoville area, Portoville College and we're trying to attract as many people along that line uh, to get them hooked up to this high-speed internet so that's a 66 million dollar project 18 counties involved so nice 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 uh, future for the Tulare County and and these other 18 counties so that's all I have thank you yes I was going to comment on that broadband matter too uh, it, it actually has quite a large uh, uh, influence throughout the county originally I thought the northern part of the county was going to be left out of it but uh, the maps that were provided yesterday indicate that they're actually going to take in Dinuba uh, going uh, east to Cutler Rossi, then north to Orange Cove and back across to uh, uh, the city of Reedley. So it actually will have a big impact on North County as well as the rest of the county. And this is an effort to bring broadband into the rural parts of uh, the country and California uh, where we have not had that in the past. And that's, that's quite important to our future uh, economic development. I met a family the other day that moved to Dinuba and uh, he works for Yahoo.com recruiting attorneys and accountants. He lives in Dinuba and uh, works out of his home on a DSL line. So it, it's a new day, you know, and you can be any place and, and have businesses and the broadband really is a, is a key component to that. So that's a very good program. Something I wanted to comment on too, piggyback on a comment by Mr. Ishida. Uh, I'd like to have us follow up with a report from the ambulance providers because uh, as you'll recall, what drove that three years ago was the uh, uh, complaints about the level of service of, of we were having of ambulance uh, providers in Tulare County and uh, Sa uh, Sa Fresno, where the headquarters of our emergency services for that purpose are located, were, were really advocating for the single provider service. And we said, you know, we really don't want to put our small business out of business in Tulare County. Let's give them the opportunity to try to come up with a system. And they have, and uh, apparently we are exceeding not only in Three Rivers, but throughout the county, we are exceeding the expectations of, uh, of response times. And apparently Fresno was just absolutely astounded at how well this is working. So I think it would be really well to have a follow-up report back to this board about how successful that program is being. And uh, a great example of working county working with private enterprise to protect those jobs and those businesses in our communities. Uh, we've had a couple of implementation meetings this last week in, um, up in District 4 in Goshen and in Cutler Rossi. Our redevelopment agencies uh, are meeting with the public there to come up with plans for the next five years and redevelopment projects. And they were both, pro both uh, meetings were pretty well attended uh, in, in those communities. So happy to see that there's that involvement within the community. And, uh, and, you know, it's, and it's just hopeful we'll be able to, to uh, produce some good results for those people in this community in terms of housing. Uh, work opportunities, job opportunities, and improvements that are communities. Uh, the big thing in my life, uh, in our family's life, I should say, this week is that my oldest son is getting married. So I'll be leaving uh, Thursday uh, to Sacramento for, for the wedding festivities, and there's a little work involved in there too. But uh, we're all very excited about that. Our, first, uh, our oldest son is the first one to get married, and so that's what's going on. Uh, that will conclude our Board of Supervisor matters. And just before we take up uh, the time item, I apologize for taking so long to get there this morning. We had a lot of items. I would like to get the consent calendar so that the folks who are here for that can, can uh, get back to where they need to get. Uh, item number 28 has been, been called to my attention to point out that uh, we will be sitting as the Tulare County Redevelopment Agency when we act on that particular item. Are there any items on the consent calendar board members wish to handle separately? If not, I will entertain a motion. Move for approval as amended. I'll second that. We have a motion from Mr. Innes, seconded by Mr. Vanderpool. Please cast your votes, and the votes are unanimous. That will then take us to our timed item. Uh, item number seven is a public hearing request from the Resource Management Agency to hold a continued public hearing and deny the appeal filed by Robert J. Owen. And uh, the process we normally follow is our staff makes a report and then we allow the, the public hearing to proceed. And so we'll begin with our, with our staff report. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Wordley, members of the board, Nick Hahn, RMA Planning. The item before you is an appeal filed by Robert Owen regarding decision of the zoning administrator denying a zone variance uh, for property located on the east side of Road 52, approximately quarter mile south of Scranton Avenue, south of Porterville. 
The requested variance is to allow a division of a home site parcel from a 4.7 acre parcel containing less than the minimum acreage required to qualify for a home site division in the zone which the property is located. The item was continued at the request of the applicant pending adoption of a home site ordinance amendment. Um, on August 10th, 2010, your board adopted ordinance number 3412, amending the home site parcel ordinance. The proposed divisional land does not qualify for um, under the requirements of the amended home site ordinance because the site does not contain the minimum acreage required to qualify for a home site division. The site and nearby surrounding properties are zoned AE10, exclusive agricultural 10 acre minimum. It should be noted that the AE10 zone serves as a holding zone to prevent urban encroachment uses that would be incompatible with the surrounding agricultural properties. The site is located outside of the Porterville urban area boundary, which is located just adjacent to the north and west boundaries of the property. This is an aerial photograph of the site. The proposed home site location is at the northwest portion of the site right there. The surrounding properties are primarily utilized for agricultural purposes. Proposed home site parcel, as indicated, would be in the northwest portion of the site. It contains a single family dwelling. The remainder of the property is vacant with the exception of a domestic well, which would be serving the home site parcel and an adjacent property owned under a different ownership. The zoning administrator denied the variance because it cannot meet the required findings of approval and that the site does not contain unusual physical conditions to justify the proposed division. Uh, the existing residence on a parcel which contains less area than allowed in the applicable agricultural zone is by no means unusual as there are numerous instances throughout the county they are similar. Um, none of the existing four to five acre parcels located to the south and either east of the site have been further divided and thus would constitute a granting a special privilege if this variance were approved and the division of a 0.37 acre and 4.33 acre parcels would not be consistent with the agricultural designation of the site as they are not considered viable agricultural parcels. Staff re requests that your board deny the appeal and uphold the zone administrator decision denying the requested variance and subject to any questions you may have. That concludes staff's report. Are there any questions from board members? If not, then we will open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to address us on this matter is invited to come forward. Mr. Owen, now would be your time. Thank you, board. My name is Robert Owen, 16151 Mustang Drive, Springville, California. I've been at this for over two years, hoping that the Planning Commission or whoever would come to a conclusion on this. I've met, I've been to most of the meetings. Um, I only got to one of the stakeholders' meetings, but I'm in pretty persistent touch with the engineers and this sort of thing. Most of what they were asking for was a little bit different than what I am. Um, it's already stated that this is not a viable agricultural site. By the time you take a 30-foot easement for a road that services the properties in the back and you take out the house, you're basically down to less than four acres. The property is not in the Williamson Act. It does have off-site water, which they don't refer to here, which means I could split it before down to less than an acre but I can go an acre or two acres split it doesn't make any difference to me I'm just trying to make the highest and best use of the land I am in real estate I am a farmer and I hate to see land out there growing weeds gophers and squirrels and just generally not going to any use plus all of that division ups the county tax rate too I have a um, you're well aware that uh, this has been called granting a special privilege. I've gone a long way in researching this special privilege and I'm afraid I don't quite understand that particular philosophy. One part I did want to read in this ordinance was um, 
The Tulare County Zoning Ordinance 15D2 G and H provides for the division of existing home site parcels containing less acreage than required by agricultural zones if certain requirements are met. The next sentence says the proposed division of land meets all of these except for the requirement the parcel being divided must contain the minimum acreage requirement. It looks to me like one sentence offsets the other. You may have a different opinion, but that's the way I'm reading it. Um, I just need to get on with this thing. It, it's um, been too long now. I realize what the county is doing in their 10-acre uh, minimums. I agree that agriculture should be protected in this county. But I also think that other people should be protected in this county where it is not viable to raise agriculture. If I had a parcel that was adjacent to this, I wouldn't be doing this. But I don't. And I don't think any of you would disagree with the fact that farming less than four acres by itself is not going to be economically feasible. So if you would take a real close look at this, um, I don't look at it as a special privilege. It's a privilege we used to have back in the years before the Rural Valley Lands Plan. And I really don't think the Rural Valley Lands Plan, and I've been familiar with it for a long time, was meant to jeopardize one part of the county and improve the other part of the county. I don't think that's the way the supervisors would really want to look at it. You want to improve the whole county, and I'm in agreement with that. So as I'm saying, you're restricting one, you're uh, helping another. So I really think that this has gotten a little out of hand on these small parcels. And that's, that's about all I have to say. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Anyone else wishing to address us this morning? During the public hearing? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, we have this on closed session, but I don't know whether there's any need for closed session. Uh, I do apologize to Mr. Owen for the length of time this has taken. Part of that was because of uh, the board's desire to try to deal with your particular issue in a global type of a way in the county, and that led to our adoption of the ordinance that went into effect uh, just recently. Mr. Chair, may I ask a global question? Certainly. How many of these do we have in the pipe? I mean, are there 10 more of these that applied a year and a half, two years ago, three years ago that have been waiting for uh, this ordinance process, which I know we've all been supportive of bringing to a conclusion? I mean, are there a lot of other projects in the pipe that are going to be coming our way? I'm not sure the specific number, but I would guess that it would be in the realm of between five and ten that were requested to be placed on hold by the applicants pending the adoption of the ordinance. Um, and some of those projects were probably submitted quite some time ago and it was decided by those applicants not to proceed with a variance application pending the outcome of the amendment. Did we spend all their money? Um, I, would, I would have to research that further and come back to you with an answer on that. I know the was it 3,500, 37? I don't remember how much it was, but there was a, uh, there's a, I know a deposit required to be made. So about $3,500. I would, Mr. Chair, with, you know, with your permission, I would, you know, encourage staff to look at that because I'm not inclined to approve these given the ordinance we passed, any of them, if they're less than the required acreage so I just hate spending people's money giving them false hope if we're ultimately going to deny it so that would globally have staff look at that and uh, not have people put a lot of money into projects because that's our fee there have been other fees I'm sure Mr. Nolan has paid land surveyors or whoever developers to do the work on this so it's a lot of money for folks to put out of pocket um, in my opinion not have a whole lot of hope at the end of the tunnel anything else uh, I, I just I tend to agree with Supervisor Cox I think that we have to um, you know there's a lot of deposits and a lot of money required and uh, if we're just going to take this money and, and kind of keep stringing people along uh, I, I think that's a real bad practice so um, you know, I, I know it was just all pending the, the uh, uh, zoning amendment, and 
uh, all, the whole process. But I, I just I know that we've continued this I think five or six times since I've been on the board, and I've only been here uh, two years. So it, it just I, I feel my heart goes out to the applicant because I just feel bad for stringing him along this whole time. Um, and you know, p pending this zoning amendment, which I think we kind of foresaw coming. Well, one thing I do want to point out, and I'll let Jake speak, but the, this was a discretionary act. This was so when when anybody uh, filed to re to request this, there was never a guarantee they were going to get yeah. this done. Right. And so, in that respect, there is a certain risk involved in having proceeded with this. Yeah. I think the action taken by the board with the adoption of the resolution or the ordinance is going to take away. People just won't even. It'll. They'll save the money because they won't bother doing it. And yeah. I think. And I think that's what you two are referring to. Is that in this case, Mr. Owen was a little bit caught in the middle of this process, but he was never assured that he would be able to actually do what he attempted to do here. So I don't want to give the impression that that, no, he, had and the, and that he had the that right happened. to actually get this accomplished. It was a discretionary act. Totally agree. Yeah. Any other questions, Mr. Jake? Uh, do you have something you want to say? Thank you, Chair. Jake Raper, Director of RMA. I uh, just wanted to restate what you had indicated is sometimes people uh, insist on filing applications uh, and we do not turn those applications down. But we do advise them that uh, especially for a variance or uh, specific findings that have to be made for granting of a variance. And uh, we have had some cases or at least one case that I know of where they had a variance applied for but after review by staff, they, the applicant withdrew the variance application, modified the parcel map to conform, to conform with the rules and regulations, and that map was approved. So that dialogue is, being, is occurring, and we're trying to encourage them to comply with the, the standards and the requirements adopted by the board. So I just wanted to give that heads up. Uh, we can't say no to somebody wanting to submit an application. Uh, we're, we'll be happy to take their application, accept their deposit, and try to have honest dialogue and communication with them as, uh, uh, in addition to that. So. I, I strongly suspect that after the adoption of the ordinance that we have that there will be far fewer of these applications made uh, because it will be much more stringent uh, requirements to try to, to get around it. So, well, And I think that, that your efforts have made it a lot more clear. Um, or a lot clearer for applicants and for us as, as the board. Um, they, you know, you just feel bad that uh, Mr. Owen was caught in the middle of this. So, uh, but um, I understand your point and thank you for clarifying. Mr. Owen, do you want to say something? I, yes. You know, gentlemen, it, it's, it's not about the money. It's about the land. It's the fact that the county is, is now saying, and I was here for the meeting when you approved this 10-acre minimum, that, okay, guys, all you folks over here that have lived here for 35 years or if you've lived here for five years, which is what they're calling for at the moment, we no longer give you the right to split off this home site, whether it be one acre, two acre, half acre, because it doesn't fit into your minimum agricultural plan. And again, I'm saying that I don't think originally when this was set up that ag was supposed to be so predominant that it left nothing for the other people who are not in basic ag. Again, I'm in both of it, but I'm not planning on trying to split up land and do subdivision and build eight houses. That's not what I want to do. i just like to see a fair shake between the ag people who want the same thing, and also some of them try to split off smaller parcels between the ag people and the other people that are trying to do something for themselves also. So I'm just not getting where this real split should be. Ten acres is a pretty good sized parcel if you're not a farmer. And I go around Porterville anyway, I don't know about by say here to Larry and I see some of these parcels that are two and three acres and all I see is a bunch of junker cars weeds fire traps and other things that are out there um, I consider a 10 acre parcel viable I think you can farm that you're not going to make a living on it but you could farm it and pay for what you do but when you get down to the size I'm talking about it three acres or less than five acres Unless you're growing something illegal, you can't pay for it doing strawberries. 
uh, you can't put enough pigs out there to make enough bacon to do any good. So I don't know where that leaves them. And that, that's what I'm looking at is the highest and best use of the land. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Time for discussion or further or ready to make an action? Yeah. Mr. Chair, I would motion to uh, deny the appeal. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. A motion by Mr. Cox, seconded by Mr. Ennis. Please cast your votes. Votes are unanimous. All right. This time we uh, will go to closed session. We do also have uh, on our addendum item, Council, or anything you need to say to us? You do, Mr. Chairman. Um, item A is off agenda. And I understand that item F is off agenda. Labor negotiations are off agenda. So that would leave you with items B through G, including the closed session item on the agenda. I do believe there will be an announcement. I do want to state for the public record that in the matter of item E, which is a disciplinary matter, this office, my office, represented the department head in the uh, underlying administrative hearing, which is being reviewed by your board. Accordingly, we will not be attending the closed session as to that matter, uh, nor will we be providing you with legal advice. Thank you, Thank you for being here this morning. I have no clue. You know, um, Brian to see his dad's in diamonds, so he's leaving the go see his dad with, for the last time. Brian Lewis. Never would have known it. It was just, it's just, yeah. It's one of those, he's been sick for a while and he's got advanced stages of cancer. He's kind of a cantankerous guy, so it's a, you're glad he's out of pain, but anyway. Actually, did they actually vote? Yes. Did they actually vote? Actually, I guessed last time. As the Gene Rousseau, County Administrative Officer, reporting out of closed session on item E in closed session to consider the discipline of a public employee. On a motion by Supervisor Cox, seconded by Supervisor Ennis, the board voted unanimously to deny the appeal filed by a sheriff deputy. <laughs> 